Uh, I studied environmental technology in Wageningen University in the last 10 years. I've mostly focused on the economic opportunities of making a cleaner planet. So building new companies, existing companies, finding new businesses by going green. Beautiful. Thank you so much, fans, for joining us. Mehavin, I would request you to briefly introduce yourself, please. Thank you so much for having me um, on the show. And um, I work with an organization called Stimulus. Uh, it's entered, um, you know, it's um, 12th year. And I think our purpose really is to work on um, sustainable development, to promote that uh, socioeconomic development. And how we're doing that is working on cleaner, greener spaces, bringing technology, technology partners who have a clean mentality about the environment, the use of resources, how we're thinking about cities um, in an urban setting, how we're making lives easy and sustainable for future generations. So we work across governments, we work across private sector, and we try to be a bridge between them. Um, and that's how we've been supporting programs like Climate Launchpad in Pakistan. Thank you. Beautiful. And I remember I was a part of last year's Climate Launchpad Pakistan, and how, and I completely enjoyed the whole idea of uh, actually uh, supporting startups and actually encouraging startups to come up with the ideas uh, that is sustainable and is, of course, friendly to the planet as well. Uh, so my first question is, of course, we all know that there's a global pandemic happening right now. Uh, my question to both of you is, how are you both coping up with this current working from home? And of course, how is your team coping up with current scenario? I'll ask Franz first, first from you, please. Um, yeah, so first of all, uh, of course, it's terrible that people are dying. Uh, and it's completely disrupting our economy. So many people are losing their jobs. Uh, the the interesting thing for me has been, um, and I guess that's what always is true. Every crisis is also a new opportunity for new stuff. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we have been discussing with Climate Launchpad, uh, right now it's a program where we bring our trainers to different countries. There's over 50 countries that are part of Climate Launchpad. So there's a lot of travel going on um, for organizing this competition. And of course, we burn a lot of carbon for that. So we've always had ambivalent thoughts on that. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, nobody can travel. Uh, yeah. So we are now forced to make an online version. Uh, so instead of running a small experiment, we're going to run the full-scale experiment in 55 <laughs> countries or 70. We don't know exactly how many will be this year. Um, and honestly, that process is fascinating. Uh, so, uh, of course, I'm very lucky. Uh, my family's healthy. I'm in a place where healthcare is really well. Um, my job is not on the line right now, although it might be in the future. So, um, so I see all those sufferings. Um, I also see the opportunity in my work. Just think, okay, um, in many ways, this is terrible. How can we turn it into something as good as possible? Um, so we're working very hard on that. And uh, yeah, in, in all its sufferings, it's a super interesting challenge. It's very ambivalent feeling, actually. That's very true, France, indeed. And uh, a lot of us who were not really thinking for us uh, to use technology in a complete way, you know, a lot of us are pushed and, of course, forced to use technology. Marine, how are you coping up with the new working from home? And how are you coping up? Um, I think, uh, I, um, seconding to what France is saying, you know, it's very painful to see. Uh, loss of human life. Uh, I think that's a very painful reality of this, uh, all the innovations and ingenuities and partnerships that will come out of it. But it's painful that we have to lose so many lives for it, to learn. Um, and I think that is something that links up well 
uh, into what we're talking about today, the relevance of it, you know, coming center stage to our lives, because it's always when something's just hit in your face and you learn to deal with it. Um, and I think the one thing about Pakistan that I know is that um, we are so resilient in our mindset uh, that sometimes we don't understand what we're facing, but we deal with it. Uh, we don't get a chance to deal with it, but the opportunity is thrown and we deal with it. And I think that's, um, as Franz says, I think in a place where we are, we're all very safe. God has been very kind to us. Uh, we have accessibility to you know lots of different amenities, but um, I will say that what something like this has done is it's created uh, so many more opportunities and so many more partnerships between institutions, organizations, governments to bring in data, information. We represent a large country. Uh, we have large amounts of data that needs to be uh, you know, coming to surface. And we will need a lot of interplay for that to happen. So I think I'm, I'm very grateful to God that I'm here at a time amongst great people where we can look to putting together great opportunities together for people so that we can deal more resiliently uh, with such scenarios in future. Beautiful. So, and that's thank you. Um, people who are watching us live now, now this is your turn. Please write your name, your organization, and write your city of residence so that France, Mehreen, and I know that who has joined us and who are watching us live. So please remember to write your name, your organization, and your city of residence. So let's start. Today, France, we're talking about clean tech, and that is a new economy drive. <coughs> Uh, I'm sure fans, a lot of people uh, are not very clear about clean tech. So if you can describe it to us, what is the link between this cleaner, greener planet and technology? How does that work? Uh, it goes way, way back. So the, it's, it's not a new thing. And it, okay. essentially, at, at one point, humans invented fire, uh, for instance. And then we learned if it's not very healthy to breathe in fire so we started building chimneys that you could call that sort of a very early clean tech solution we built chimneys um, and from there on we learned that if we have an industrial nation we have lots of chimneys and well we still have a problem so we put filters on the chimneys and you know so the so it's basically it, it's not a, a complicated term I'd say it's simply using smart solutions to have a society with lots of welfare, but that also respects the, the sort of the boundaries of the planet. And um, well, if we're, we're 8 billion people now almost, um, you know, we put quite a strain on the planet and for all of that to play out well, we're, well, we all know we're not doing that great in many, in many ways. Although there is also lots of progress, like not many people know this, but in the sixties, just, in, that is just, how long is that ago? That's, 60 years ago. So 1960s, tens of thousands of people died in London because of air pollution. It's, it's not that long mm -hmm. ago. Um, so this is after the Second World War. Uh, the, 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 look it up, the big smog of London. I think more than 10,000 people died simply because, well, <laughs> they didn't have good filters on their, um, on all their chimneys. Uh, so, so we're, we've, so if you look at the West, Western countries, um, They've managed to make their life environment clean. So I live in a city called Amsterdam. If I look outside, I see blue skies. And I remember getting a friend over from China and he, he just kept staring at it. Like, it's so blue. He says, well, it's really simple. If in China you fix pollution from chimneys, you will have the same sky. It's been there all along. You just don't see it right now. Um, so. So every country that goes through this development process will eventually fix its local problems. That's sort of our first priority. We take care of ourselves first. But then the bigger question that we face right now is, well, 8 billion of us together have created a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, and that is making the planet as a whole unlivable. And it's not for our personal health, not necessarily. Most people are not suffering in that way. Uh, but long term, it's a crisis that is just as big as Corona and, and, and possibly even bigger. So the so the work that we've been doing at Climate Launchpad is to uh, sort of see this long-term problem, try to come up with really practical solutions to do something about it, and then the idea is that if you have a really complicated problem like climate change, which is eight billion of us all producing too much carbon, and of course I'm from the West, so I produce even more 
than people in in Asia, for instance. Uh, but but all this, there are so many solutions needed. So what we say with Climate Launchpad is we try to fix climate change one startup at a time. So it's just one solution at a time. We're going to need thousands of solutions, and we need them local and we need them at the global scale. Beautiful. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does definitely. Maybe. Uh, so what Francis has said that this climate issue it could be as big as or maybe worse than the corona right now. And yes, we are seeing that a lot of people are already dying from coronavirus. And the, I guess the point is that corona is killing people instantly now. Now we see a lot of this, you know, in just what, three, four months now. Uh, but do you think that even when this coronavirus is happening, we have gotten back to that mode? I mean, you people have been and the world has been talking about climate change for years now. And yet very small effort has been done. And what do you think about that? Because when I see the climate change, I don't think that there'll be any vaccine for that. I'm sure there'll be a vaccine for Corona, but I don't think so there'll be a vaccine for that. What, what's your take on that? Um, I like that statement, uh, Zen. I'm sure Zen's already, uh, France is already very excited to hear that there's going to be a vaccine for climate change. And I think we can <laughs> start fighting some entrepreneurs for that as well. But I think, uh, you know, I was uh, listening to Trump on TV uh, yesterday, and he was saying that you know uh, we're going to be allowing our our uh, states and our governors to make individual decisions about how they want to open up economic activity and how they want to get back to life because they're all very empowered, they're all very capable, uh, you know. And the fact that we're asking universities, we're asking researchers to come up with solutions so that we can hone and harness them and we can put them to use. Um, and I think uh, the fact that something like this happened and it suddenly gave a boost to all those entrepreneurs and all those, the innovation mindset, and there was a value for it that was seen. Uh, so I feel that um, I don't know when the dust is going to settle with this. I think it's going to take a long time. I, I think, you know, we've experienced disasters like the earthquake in Pakistan. Uh, uh, have we recovered from it? No, we haven't recovered from it. Uh, you know, uh, that was climate impacted, uh, you know, the loss of life. We still don't have a bearing on the kind of loss of life that we had as a result. But life goes on. You know, the, the, the philosophy of life is that while all of this goes on, there is life that just continues. It just doesn't stop for anything. You know, whether you lose a loved one, uh, whether you make an innovation in your life or you just live redundantly, keep contributing to the environment and to the taking away from the planet. Uh, life goes on. So whilst that philosophy goes on, um, even with this pandemic, I think we will continue to do things. And I, I really hope that we learn from it. But to even imagine that things will go back, things don't go back. Uh, change is always forward, you know, yeah. at least in, in my imagination. Um, so what has already mm -hmm. happened is that a lot of people who were not willing in this part of the world, in Pakistan, you know, I love the city that uh, France is living in. I love their country. It's so clean and it's so green and it's so blue that, yes, we do go there and we say, wow. Uh, but we get to say that over here as well in Pakistan because we don't have uh, that situation with us because we're still from the developing world, you know. Yeah. Uh, but we have other challenges. So it's about recognizing those challenges. And I think it's about, uh, you know, there have been some brilliant articles written by people. And, and, you know, they talk about the fact that we love working on a current situation working on a future situation, a disaster that may loom. You know, uh, my, uh, my, my husband may leave me. You know, my children may decide to go against my wishes. Uh, I may decide to become a chef tomorrow. You know, we, do, we, mm -hmm. when we're thinking about all of these things, uh, we're always thinking about the fact that when it's future planning, it's not happening right now. It's not a disaster. It's a disaster when it's going to happen. So climate change, it's going to become a disaster when it becomes imminent in our face. Uh, and learning from something like this pandemic tells us that, you know, there have been lots of administrations that have been talking about predictions that already suggested in the last 10, 20 years that a pandemic would hit the world. How ready are the most developed parts of the world, the most developed economies to deal with that kind of resilience? We're looking at it right now, you know. And then in that situation, I look at down south, countries like us, Bangladesh, how are we dealing with it? As far as the mindset is concerned, we're brilliant at dealing with it, you know. 
as far as the wherewithal is concerned, the infrastructure, the government, the linkages, that's a different matter altogether. So, <laughs> you know, so I think that's just my little take on it. And I think we will not be able to go back to life as it is. We will be relying more on digital and spaced out interactions. We will be looking at cost efficiencies. We will perhaps not focus so much on the fact that it's an environmental efficiency. We're cutting down on the carbon. I don't think we think about those things here as a priority. To that, and of course, uh, I completely agree that the life would not be the same anymore. Um, so, my first, my next question is: So, in this context of clean tech, do you see a clean technology as an economic driver for the future, or all the startups that are coming up and all those innovative innovative labs that are coming up? How do you see that clean tech being an integral role uh, of all these people who are coming up with innovative and new ideas? What do you think, fans? Yeah. So maybe. Uh, uh, scroll back, uh, let's say 50 years. So, so I, I started studying environmental technology in the Netherlands in 1985. Uh, that's how long ago? 35 years ago. And at that time, uh, I had to do a paper on wind energy, uh, in my first year. And the, the question we got from our professor was, well, can wind energy be a technology that is cost competitive with coal or all these other ways to produce electricity? And um, well, we did our paper, we did our research and our conclusion was, of course not, it's impossible, it's way too expensive. Right now, if you look at most places in the world, wind is gonna be your cheapest solution. It's, it's even cheaper than running a coal fired power plant that's already been paid for. So a 40 year old coal fired power plant, keep it up and running is more expensive than build a new wind turbine. Well, that took 35 years. Now, um, if you would have asked me that question for solar in uh, 1985, th that wasn't even on the radar of anybody. Solar was for satellites, you, you know, it's like so expensive. The only way to use it is to do really exotic applications in space because, you know, it's bringing a battery up in space is even more expensive because it's very heavy and it only works for a few months and then you, you, you throw away your billion dollar satellite. So yeah, solar panels are good for that. If you look now, my bed is in Pakistan, PV panels are even cheaper than wind in many locations and, yeah. and, and cost competitive. That was unimaginable only like 25 years ago. Mm. Now, in the early 90s, I worked at the environmental department of the ministry of, uh, not, not a, of the city of Amsterdam, so not at the ministry, but the city. And um, I was running a pilot then with an electric car. And it was a, a Volkswagen, but it was it's tweaked around. So they completely ripped it out on the inside and put a super expensive battery in, uh, a, a sodium sulfur battery. It was really high tech. And just that battery cost 250,000 euros. And I, I don't even know how many rupees that is, that is but it's ridiculous amounts. Um, and so if you would have asked me in the early nineties, well, will electric cars be ever a technology that is ready for consumers? I would have said, of course not. It's way too expensive and so complicated. So it's 2020 now, cars are almost, electric cars are almost cost competitive with normal cars. Uh, they will be in like five years. Wind and solar are the cheapest that we that we can get right now in terms of electricity production. So if you look up at, at sort of the long view of this, there's reasons to be super optimistic because we actually transformed major sectors of, of lots of carbon producing, so cars, electri electricity production, and they are they will become cleaner and cleaner. And if you look at deployment in the United States, it's really interesting. So we have this 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 guy with the orange hair and the you know that guy uh, in the White House, and um, and he basically says I'm gonna buy as much coal as I can because coal's great. Yeah, coal's great. Um, what is happening right now in the United States? They're still closing down coal-fired power plants. Why is that? Because it's simply too expensive. So even with a corrupt government that is willing to do anything to get a few votes, coal is still losing. Mm. So, so, so we basically proven that it is completely possible to transform big sectors of the, of the, of the economy in a way that brings in new entrepreneurs, because of course those wind turbines were not built by large companies. The first wind turbines were built by small companies.
And then the bigger companies were like, oh, we should get into that market. And then they bought them. So that's how Siemens yeah. became one of the bigger players in the world in wind energy. It's not that they saw the opportunity. They saw the opportunity once it was already created. Then they bought a company for a lot of money. And now they are a big producer. So, so in general, I'm very optimistic. If you look at waste, there is still like, you know, we still talk about waste. Nature yeah. doesn't have waste. Waste in nature is much smarter than to create waste, right? Um, so we have waste as a opportunity. We have uh, steel production. We have making fuels that we don't suck out of the ground, but simply take carbon out of the atmosphere and we make fuels with it. That's what nature does, right? The tree sucks out CO2 out of the atmosphere and makes a tree. We can do that too. So the, so the technology puzzles are actually not that complicated. Uh, what is complicated is to create a an ecosystem where these new technologies and all these innovations get a real chance to grow up and that growing up is hard and the, and the reason for instance for wind why it happened was because one country denmark said we will try to fix this problem and of course denmark has lots of wind i don't know if you've ever been there but it's it's completely flat there's nothing there and it's all around it's it's surrounded by sea so if there's one place on planet earth where you have a lot of wind it's going to be denmark so Denmark saw the opportunity of wind, but paid a lot of money to basically build a research university around it, build an industry around it, paid for the first sort of 20 years of producing electricity that was very expensive. Germany did the same for solar. Uh, California, the Netherlands and Norway did the same for electric cars. So, so it takes governments to say, well, we'll create a market for a new solution. We'll do it not for two years, but we'll do it for 10 years plus. And then entrepreneurs can come in and bring in their solutions because uh, yeah, well this, this is long enough this is my take it's a huge opportunity there was a there was comprehensive explain and i love the example but you talk about denmark you talk about california you talk about germany uh maybe so let's put this discussion because we have a lot of people watching us from pakistan right now um uh, we talk about pakistan um uh, how do you see this this clean tech uh, and how do you see our own entrepreneurs actually adapt and adapt to this clean tech? And what do you see in the next, let's say, five years down the line? How are we as a nation going to um, embrace the clean technology? Uh, well, I, I hope I can justify some part of that. And in France, please help me out on this. Um, so I think it's about uh, what I've learned and I've, I've, I've had so much opportunity to learn from such great people uh, always, you know. Uh, so Stimulus as an organization works to uh, try to support. And, and I think that's really been our focus, our mandate from the start is to create an ecosystem, you know. Uh, so we try to influence people and bring them together. And I will say that my understanding is, over the last couple of years has been that it's about an economic priority for a country. Um, you know, if you are in a developed state, uh, you can really work on a vaster range of things, uh, not suggesting in any way that those innovations don't happen. Like France said that, you know, if you look at, if you go back in time, if I go back to the earliest city in this part of land in the Indus uh, continent, I look at Mohenjo-daro, the water systems that we had, the waste systems that we had, uh, they're still studied by various parts of the world you know so if you go back in time when you know when we learned to uh you know make fire from trees and then coming out of that understanding so you know i feel that it's not a priority for us so that's one thing that's a daunting reality in pakistan you know uh france talks about denmark as an example and it's been fantastic because we've been trying to reach out to uh, the, 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 the experts and even the Danish government, you know, for example, like we've been reaching out to experts in the Netherlands and Germany so that we can bring those stakeholders here to help us out with our realities and our needs. Uh, because, the, because one of the challenges that we have here in Pakistan is the scale that we have, you know, so there may be a solution that exists in the Netherlands. But being able to apply that solution to our scale in Pakistan, you're talking about two different bandwidths, all right? Uh, we're talking about, uh, I mean, just Karachi alone, if I look at the city, uh, it's more than 22 million people plus, you know? We're a different ball game altogether. So if we're talking about the future of how it holds, so is it a government priority? We have a 
great wind corridor. You know, it's something to really reckon with. Uh, but for example, has it traditionally been a, a priority for our government? We are lacking in policies. We are lacking in a framework to operate. We don't have a level playing field for people to come in to enjoy the opportunity of business and economic uh, opportunity to draw that. So, for example, because these scenarios happen, this is not in any way trying to blame the government, you know, but the government has other priorities. This does not mean this is not a priority, but this does not become center stage for us. So that's one reality in Pakistan for the entrepreneurs to understand that that's that's the playing field. That's the boundary that you're talking about, that there is no boundary. Uh, you'll have to come up with uh, scenarios. You'll have to be very resilient yourself as entrepreneurs and learn to come up with solutions that uh, second thing, I feel that for the entrepreneurs, it's very important important to have that inquisitiveness, that desire to explore, the desire to go and search for solutions that are for dealing with homegrown problems. Uh, you know, where we're such a big nation. You know, can we locally, as an economy, supply to ourselves? Uh, can we supply to the consumers of this market? When can we understand? You know, how urban cities are uh, understanding the concept of transition. You know, how people transit, how people use transportation, how it, you know, creates uh, lots of environmental impacts and how it impacts people at an economic level. How does it make life easy? How is food uh, stored? How is um, material recycled? Do we have understanding of these things? No, we don't because it's not an economic priority. So this is what our youth needs to understand. Uh, so there will be people, and I see amongst questions, a, a great friend from last year's program on Climate Launchpad Pakistan asking that, should we go down to the school level? Yes, we need to go down at every level so that we can make the generations that are coming up as we speak, we get them ready to understand that, you know, there's an ongoing process that's adding to our situation, you know, and there is a current situation in which we need to come up with solutions. So in the next five years, I hope that learning from the pandemic of Corona, every time I read something, I read that after the dust settles down, companies are going to go crazy, economies are going to go crazy, they're going to burn more fuel, they're going to just work 20 shifts a day and nobody's going to stop. And the fact that the satellite looks at China and says that the atmosphere is clearing up, it's all going to come back in a week. Uh, yeah. God forbid, if that is to happen, that must not <laughs> deter uh, climate activists, that must not deter us climate thinkers. Uh, to surge forward and go out to the industry, make it more relevant. Because here in Pakistan, when we talk about a climate change solution, uh, the industry is not in that mindset. You're not talking to people on a level playing field. You're not. The government is not understanding that as a priority. We need to break down the information. So in the next five years, there needs to be a lot of uh, knowledge sharing platform like this. We need to have people like France and others help us build our capabilities so that our youth can use this fantastic knowledge, uh, look at the best universities, the best, best people from the best academia around the world, and work on local homegrown solutions. So that's that's my data. Beautifully explained, Mehavi. So people who are watching us now live, um, you can always ask a question. So how our show works is that on for 30 minutes, 30 to 25 minutes, I ask questions that is relevant to the topic typically. And then after 30 to 25 minutes, I take questions from my live audience. So please, yes. I already see few of the questions who are there, which are there, and of course, I'm going to take that and ask guests about those questions. I have one more question before I go to the audience question, and that question is from France. Uh, so France, um, after 2008 global recession, we saw brands like Uber, we saw brands like Airbnb, and they came up because people had empty property, people had vacant cars, and those brands thought that, you know what, you make best use of your unused car or you make best use of your very, very, very big villas and, you know, let others use it. What opportunities do you see in clean tech after this global pandemic is over? Huh. Well, if there's one thing I've learned from from seeing at least a thousand startups is, is to become very modest. Um, so. So, of course, I have opinions when I see ideas. Something inside me will say, oh, God, that's a terrible idea. Or, oh, I really like that one. That Oh, that I'm sure that's going to be a success. And my, my success in predicting has been incredibly low. So I, I remember vividly uh, a team from Germany 
they were called Evolo. If you if you want to search for them, look up a Velocopter or Volocopter. And they were two completely crazy guys. One of them was a former DJ who had tattoos all over him. He was very good at sharing wild stories about the Berlin uh, party scene. The last thing he was he was qualified for is to start a company for electric flight. And what they built was sort of a big drone where a person could sit on. And he actually, there's a, if you go online and look to Volocopter, you can find him sit on a yoga ball, one of those bouncing ones, with a huge structure around him with drones. And he's literally flying. The guys, they, they were completely nuts. So for me, it was completely clear. This company was not going to be nothing. That was just a very bad idea. Okay. They just raised, I think, 50 million euros uh, for a taxi service in Dubai. For, you know, so... Um, so, so you, you asked the question, well, Franz, where do you think the opportunities are? I would just like to, before I say anything, disqualify myself as a very uh, knowledgeable person. I, I, I've missed many successes of others, even though I was, very, I was there at the very early start. Um, then, of course, I do have opinions. So what do I think? Um, the, uh, the one thing that will certainly stick around is what we are doing right now. So, so we've all become sort of many people have been skeptical about doing things online uh, yeah. and of course this is less fun than meeting both of you in Pakistan as we did last year you know the I remember vividly doing the training in, in Karachi and then afterwards having drinks I remember you we, we had dinner at the sea you know all those wonderful things we can't do those memories here uh, but still this can work pretty well um, so it's still much better than nothing uh, so, so this is so video and online is is a perfect example of a disruptive innovation. And the disruptive innovations tend to be less good than the alternative, but much better than nothing, and much cheaper. Uh, so the uh, the small computer, the personal computer, it's an example from the 70s, was very cheap, couldn't do much, but was much better than nothing. And of course, completely inferior to the the huge IBM mainframe computers. But people were happy to have something instead of nothing. So. What I expect is this this has all been a crash course for managers in at the highest level of companies, of government. I mean, we just had a meeting, for God's sake, of all European leaders, and they're all behind video screens. It's, that never happened before. So that's going to be a big new normal, I'm quite sure. Like, people will, will start asking the questions, well, do we really have to meet? <laughs> Whereas up until now it was, well, of course we need to meet, and only if it's, if it's impossible, we'll see if we can do it over video. So, so that one I can certainly see. Um, another one that will that people will probably be more comfortable with now is getting stuff delivered at home. And it depends a little on what society you are, but but to sort of have an infrastructure in place where people bring you stuff. You can see the same for e-medicine, although most of us prefer to see a doctor, of course. I think all of us actually prefer to see a doctor just because they can say, it's okay, don't worry too much. Um, and and you you don't really believe them if they haven't touched you or seen you. There's a there's <laughs> psychology involved there. Um, so so those are a few you can easily imagine. What I also expect. Um, so my daughter's 13 now, and I've been telling her from the start when this happened. Eva, listen, I'm 53. You are 13. Mm. I have never seen anything like this. Never. Mm. Pay attention, pay attention to what's going on, because it's very unlikely that you will see this again. But this whole generation that is sort of thrown, the, the, like if you look at the millennial and the G, the X and the Y and the Z generations, yeah. they basically had a perfect life. You know, the, like especially in, in, if you look at the West, if you look at places like this, you know, no problems. Yeah, we had a small financial crisis in 2008. Well, it was, if you look at it, look at backwards, it's not that big a dip. But this one, wow, it really hits and it hits everybody's life. So I'm very curious about this generation that is sort of in their puberty, that is, is very aware of what's going on and forced into something that they didn't choose themselves. And then sort of figuring out, well, we actually deal with it quite well. Because if I look around me, if I look at any country that I see, it seems that almost everybody is coping with it quite well, apart from the suffering. I mean, that's just heartbreaking. But but. Uh, the rest of us, well, you know, we're, we're just dealing. So I'm expecting a generation that's going to be uh, have a mindset of improvisation as a default. Uh, 
Whereas the the generations, the past two sort of twenty years, yeah, we we have a, a saying in Dutch: they were fed with a silver spoon. You know, everything mm -hmm. was perfect, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it gives a sort of luxury feeling about life. And and if you get are you, if you're sort of forced into a crisis and need to improvise and then figure out, oh, we're actually. Hmm, I didn't die. Nobody. Well, some people died because of sickness, but I was okay. I know how to improvise. I think it's it's a big mental lesson for that whole generation. So I'm kind of curious how that will influence them as 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 they grow into society. Interesting, and of course, um, yes, you wait you on that. I don't remember. Uh, I mean, in my age, and nobody remembers in their age if they have seen something of this sort, uh, where people are dying and there's no infrastructure damage as such. We have seen wars in different parts of the world where the buildings. Yeah. Collapse. People used to die because of the bombs and the terrorism activities, but nothing of this sort. So let's take some questions now. We have a lot of questions coming up right away. So let me start off with one question, and Mehir, I would request you to ask this question. This question is from our previous year participant, Sana Kwan Hussain, and he's asking, uh, from actually asking from both of you, were you guys expecting how quickly the environment has regenerated itself within within a few weeks of lockdown? Referring to the air quality and sky visibility. In the whole Pakistan, particularly, but it's true in most of the cities. Maybe, what do you think? Um, yes, I, I can say that since the since the challenge has been, I mean, if I talk about the air pollution in in Lahore, I mean, yes, it has certainly seen an impact, just as China has seen it, just as New Delhi has seen it. Uh, the lockdown has helped uh, in that way, and. That is what nature is still telling us: is that I still have room to regenerate, you know. Mm -hmm. But beyond a beyond a certain point, you can use the best and most expensive face creams. But if I have to age, I will age. There is nothing that's going to stop it, you know. So there is there is one part of life that you can't change, you know. And this is the most daunting reality, uh, you know. In in our part of the world, we call it faith. Uh, that is our faith, you know. Uh, so you have to look for you have to look after uh, what what you're using. You know, if you have to keep the resupply and the remanagement of it going. Um, and I think yes, it's true that we have seen that there has been an improvement. But the fact is, uh, the question to each one of us is: What are we going to do with this improvement? What are we going to do about the fact that we were all forced to spend time with each other as families and as individuals and as units, uh, and we were all forced to be using less, consuming less, needing less, uh, you know, forced to need less. Uh, what are we going to do about it next week or two weeks later or two months later when things seemingly feel like they've gone back? You know, I, I love the fact that every day I hear all of us uh, saying, when will things go back? <laughs> so yeah. I, I feel that things are not going to be going back. Uh, God forbid, I hope that we don't go back. I hope that we do not... Uh, you know, uh, go back in time. I hope that we surge forward and I hope that we continue to understand uh, what we can stop, what we can enjoy, you know, when we go out of this. Uh, I hope that uh, how we have stopped using cars, how we have tried to recognize the need for uh, things like concepts such as the circular economy. Why have they come up? Why did the Ubers come out? Why did Airbnb come up? Uh, it's because we suddenly realized we had so much space. We suddenly realized we could share so much. Uh, yeah. Suddenly realized that we didn't need as much. Suddenly realized that we can make some economic opportunity out of it. So all these solutions have been happening. Um, and I, if I look at our part of the world in Pakistan, uh, oftentimes when I go to Europe, uh, especially when I go to Germany, when I go to Brussels, uh, Belgium, when I go to the Netherlands, uh, what I realize is that there's so much that we take here in Pakistan for granted uh, that actually doesn't exist over there in a different way. For example, yeah. if I think about uh, food delivery, if I think about medicine delivery, if I think about emergency delivery, uh, you know, I had an accident in the Netherlands last year in September. Um, it took me almost a day to figure out what was the nearest hospital that I could figure out my way to. I'm pretty good on the internet. Um, and uh, a funny incident happened even over there. But uh, what I would like to believe is that in our part of the world, uh, there are lots of things like food delivery, like getting somewhere, like, you know, we never think we can't do this. A shop is closed, you know, there's always a select 
door at a petrol station that's open all night, even in, in, in the boonies. You know, you'll always have in the smallest villages of Pakistan, you have great brands, great multinationals, corporations sending products to the women in the household. They're sending food to them already before the disaster. So somehow what happened was that we're not talking about four and six million consumer base that's digitally savvy. We're talking about over uh, 60 million people. Or we're talking about over a hundred and six, sorry, 160, 160, million, people, yeah, right? more. 160 yeah. million people who are digital subscribers out of Pakistan. So if we're looking at that kind of database, we already have women sitting in a village uh, getting stuff across to her. So these things have already been happening here. For us, it's about uh, exploring other opportunities for ourselves. So that's my take on it. Um, thanks, Sana, that. for that question. And uh, I guess, uh, uh, fast. the next question is actually uh, to you, and it's about Climate Launchpad. And maybe maybe you can add two bits to it as well. So Farhad is asking that last year, for the first time, we had Pakistan represented in the Climate Launchpad. What was mm -hmm. your general feeling to see Pakistanis actually uh, taking care of the climate and Pakistani startups and entrepreneurs actually? So you were in Karachi as well for the training. And of course, some of our people went to Netherlands Amsterdam for the final competition. What was your journey feeling for it? And of course, something that you were talking about that. Yeah. Well, what is really nice about that question um, is uh, that it, it ends with, what is your general feeling to see us? And, it, <laughs> the, the, and my, my initial response when I saw that, my heart opened up. It's like, oh, it was so great to see all of you. So, um, so <clears throat> let me just say, you are a wonderful people. I, I'm so generous and so kind. Uh, so that, that was my first response. Um, but that's more the human side of things. So on the, on the clean tech side of things, yeah. um, what, is in, what, what was interesting for me about Pakistan, so I, I go to many countries, right? I, I probably visited 30 different countries for Climate Launchpad. Um, and you, see, you seem to have a little bit of an underdog mindset. And it's partly because you have this big neighbor that keeps bugging you, uh, called uh, India, um, and they're even bigger than you, right? Uh, yeah. But in terms of population, you're the fifth country in the world, something like that, 220 million people. So, yeah. Yeah. so the opportunity, like I'm, you know, Karachi has more inhabitants than my whole country, okay? The Netherlands <laughs> only has like 17 million people. We're a tiny country. so. So the scale of a country as Pakistan and the diversity in landscape and climate and the diversity of its economy is is mind boggling. And and the so so if I would have one message for in general for Pakistan as a country is that you are huge. Like you're number five country in the world. So if you could come up with something that works locally. That, that is a very good solution in Pakistan. And, and if you would come up with, let's say, 10 of those, I would bet that one of those 10, at least one of those 10 could be a global solution because it works in a country of 220 million people. And that's basically, that's what Denmark did. So j just for reference, Denmark, 5 million people. It's a sliver, it's a sliver <laughs> of a country, it's nothing. They have still the biggest market share in producing wind turbines in the world. So, so literally 5 million people transformed our energy system. Imagine what you could do with a country of 220 million. That's, that's mind boggling to me. Mind boggling. Now, of course, the, one of the reasons it worked in Denmark was because there was government backing. The, mm -hmm. the, like this was not something that only came out of private enterprise. There was government backing, that backing went into research at the Technical University of Denmark. It went into subsidies for companies to do their first wind turbine pilots and so on. So that's a complicated process that took them 20 years sort of to figure out. But in general, you know, you are not a small country compared to India. You mm -hmm. are on the global stage, the fifth country in the world. So if we talk about solutions for the next 30, 40 years in the world, my guess is that 10% of those solutions need to come out of Pakistan. And those, those solutions will generate millions of jobs, millions of jobs, right? So, so that is my general feeling. Now, what I see Marine do with her company 
bless her, you know, I, I love her work. She is mostly bringing Western solutions into Pakistan. So she's basically, she's scouting outside, um, seeing what, what works there that could work in our location so we can improve our agriculture, we could improve our energy system, we can make it more resilient, all those things. What I wish for Marine's company and for her competitors and for you as a country as a whole, is that you start bringing stuff to us. That, that would be the challenge. And, the, uh, and, and so the first step in that, I think, is a mindset change, is that you see yourself as what you literally are. You are huge, right? Yeah. Um, so that would be one. The, if there's one lesson that I would take from all the places I've been and, and how I see sort of these technologies evolve over time, the strongest position is always solve your, your own problem first. The, because it's so much easier to convince a politician to solve a local problem than to do something that is abstract out there. Um, yeah. and, the, um, and, and in general, the strongest environmental solutions are the ones that are not about doing less. So, yeah. so telling people, yeah, you need to fly less because it's bad for the environment. Well, 10% of the people will listen to that, 90% will not. So, so yeah. for a solution to really work, it's, it's better if the environmental argument comes last. So, so basically what Tesla did, they built a, com a car that was better than any electric car you could get. It was faster, it was quieter, it was more comfortable, and it was a little roadster, then they, then they started building the bigger ones. But their pitch was, we have this amazing sports car that is better than a Porsche or a Lamborghini, it's faster. Oh, by the way, it's cheaper too. Oh, by the way, it's greener. It, it, it doesn't use fuel, it's just electricity, but, but who cares? Um, you know, it's a better car. That is always the strongest proposition. So, so an attitude of we are actually huge, solve a local problem and try to solve it in a way that doesn't put the environmental argument first, those in general are the strongest propositions. Now, what I see happening, I, I do see is going back actually. So I know Maureen, uh, has said several times already. Oh God! I don't. We hope. I don't. I hope we don't go back. What I expect actually is that we'll go back, mostly to before, and it's simply because it's um, there, there's a lot of forces in play that try to keep us where we are. Um, but then again, if I look at the long view over the past fifty years and how things have changed, that we've created basically miracles almost. Like literally, if you if you had had a bet with me in 1985 when I was a student in uh, in Wageningen, and bet with me, I bet that winter is going to be cheaper in 2020 than coal. I would have bet on coal. I would have been completely sure that I was going to make a lot of money out of that bet. And so that means I'm an insider. I'm an optimistic person. I want these green technologies to win, but I still would have bet against it. So. So what I think is that in the long run, we underestimate the opportunities and the possibilities of change. Beautiful. Great observation by you about Pakistan. And I guess, uh, I don't know. I by the way, can I, make, can I make one remark? I see on the Please. chat, we, we created a new term. Norman picked up on my, uh, Norman Nasrullah picked up on my, uh, that my, my daughter's <laughs> the generation of improvisation. So let's let's yeah. dub this the, the improvisation generation. We have a term for it. Yeah, I love that. It's brilliant. And, yeah. it, and it started here, you know, at Fundwell. <laughs> yeah, we created the, the improvisation generation. Beautiful. And uh, I guess uh, Mary would agree on that, that we Pakistanis, you know, we need an outsiders to tell us that we are actually good. And then only we start working on something. That's, oh, that is one of the dilemmas of our country too. Uh, so what Franz talked about, Marvin, is also about uh, how can we make use of our population and how can we uh, actually drive economy out of that. Shahi Nawaz has a question with that was very much relevant to that. Shahi is asking, we are facing current energy crisis as well as climate change. Need such initiative in our country level. Can we establish such tools in domestic purposes? Can we do something for domestic users maybe? Of course, I think uh, it's very important. I think uh, the dialogues have already started happening. The fact that this dialogue is happening today, 
uh, is proof of the fact and we are not the only ones. We must know that there are so many others and connecting with everyone. Um, yeah. And we don't need to hijack spaces because there's so much to do. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and the idea is that uh, competition does not need to start happening before we've even ended up understanding the opportunity. So the opportunity is really big. I, I agree. Uh, while I keep saying that we must not go back, I must uh, uh, emphasize again and again that we must go back to the basics where we didn't need as much, uh, you know. Uh, and yes, every time uh, we look at a problem like this, or, you know, we go and talk about people, planet, and profitability, and we talk about such great things, uh, I think it's about applying it, you know, uh, when you don't need it, understanding the fact that you apply good things when it's not needed. You know, people work out when they're already fit. Uh, you know, if you haven't worked out a day in your life and you want to work out for the first time when you're 300 pounds, it becomes a daunting challenge. Uh, you know, so you want to make small steps. Mm -hmm. We want to take those small steps for everything that we're doing. Uh, even in Pakistan, I feel that it is, uh, yes, the energy crisis has been there and there's a lot that we've achieved. I mean, you know, from when even just stimulus started working, started working very small uh, projects, you know, 10, 12 years back in the energy sector. I think from then alone in the last 12 years, we've seen such great things happening in, in Pakistan. The energy crisis, yes, there is a crisis, but there have been lots of elements that have been worked upon. There are still lots of elements that need to be worked upon. And this is the opportunity that lies with the generation of improvisation, that they come up with those solutions. Uh, we understand our solutions and we reach out to people like France and others so that we can not bring their solution. They already have a solution that works for them. They can bring their learnings down here for us. Mm -hmm. They can bring us the benchmarks. That's why we have France sitting here today. Uh, you know, I, I would love to see uh, one of France's other friends, uh, Hans, uh, had spoken to me about the fact that we do a lot of work on minerals and we do a lot of work on mining and, you know, there are different components. So when we look at interesting sectors, you know, uh, for Pakistan, what is interesting is agriculture. For Pakistan, what is interesting is water. For Pakistan, what is interesting is these are interesting sectors for us to explore. Uh, but it's also interesting for us to explore a sector that has not been explored uh, to the depth that it needs to, which is mining and minerals, for example. When we're looking at lots of natural resources and how we can use the interplay to learn from others. Uh, and I think I think it's a learning mindset. It's about reaching out to people, and I hope that uh, we continue to do this, you know. So that's my two bits. Thank you. you. And that was really brilliant to uh, really explain, I mean. uh, Just one more question I'm going to take, uh, because right now it's 52 minutes and something, and you pretend to finish our show in 60 to 55 minutes. And I'm sure a lot of people want to ask a lot of questions too. But again, we have lack of time. So my next question is for you fans. Uh, Fatima Anila is actually asking, a few weeks of lockdown in the world and its positive impact on climate has created an evidence for climate crisis denial. Should we expect more investment available for clean tech innovations? Are we expecting that? Hello, Fatima. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Huh? So the, the, the thing so I, w I wish that this would be true, of course. Um, and I would say that a lot of this will be down to national leaders. So, so every every prime minister, every involved minister is trying to figure out, okay, what is my answer to this crisis? And of course, step one is trying to control the pandemic as much as we can, trying to make sure that the hospitals are not overflowing. And once sort of you get to that, point uh, so yeah all of europe is in a lockdown now we can create a little breathing space and we can start of opening up the economy now again and well my expectations for the netherlands our economy probably dropped by 20 percent, something like that the, the the official economists still think it's about seven uh, yeah. if i look just what's happening around me i i think they're they're completely missing it so so 20 percent. let's let's assume 20 percent economic dip that's unprecedented. That that has never happened to the Netherlands. So, so all governments will come up with some sort of investment agenda that says, okay, let's compensate. Try to, to sort of this enormous dip in spending. Try to compensate with government spending. Uh, invest in things that create jobs, so we we sort of get this economy going again. Then, of course, what is crucial is where you will direct that money. 
So will you bail out airlines? Or will you put that money in more solar panels that are installed across the country? The, the, those are the types of questions. And, and, and those will be answered locally. So if, if you look what Obama did in 2008, they basically created a big green fund as part of their 700 billion relief. If you look at the Netherlands right now, we're in the middle of this fight. Uh, and this fight is, is in every country. So, so what we all should do as individuals is, is make our voices heard wherever we are at the local level, at the provinces level, at the state level, at the, at the federal level. Um, so if so, simply write your politicians, write to them that this is an opportunity to spend a lot of extra money and put them into green jobs because green jobs, you know, do two things. They create jobs and they do something for the environment because of course, everybody enjoys clean air. That we, like if there's one thing we've proven with this crisis, if we shrink the economy by 20%, we all get to see blue skies. Wow, that's really interesting. Now, of course, not everybody is willing to pay that 20%. But if we can sell that blue sky by saying, well, we don't have to shrink the economy. We just need to put our money in different, in different areas of technology and into different markets. Then we can still have blue skies, but we can also have jobs. I, I think most politicians are, are gonna be listening better and then still, you know, let's be uh, not naive. I'm a political scientist by training too. Um, the lobbyists from the oil industry and, uh, and the aviation industry and uh, all those, they, they have more phone numbers of politicians than we have. But it doesn't mean <laughs> that we shouldn't have our voices heard. So, so use Facebook, whatever it is that you wanna use, but make your voice heard. It is in the end, a big opportunity to spend money on green jobs. You we explained uh, fans and of course we need to get our voices heard uh, thank you so much fans for being here with us thank you so much Mehveen for being here with us thank you. Uh, before we close before thank we you, end, I would like closing remarks from both of you Mehveen your closing remarks for everybody who's watching us on online uh, and of course in this current in the middle, middle of a global <coughs> pandemic right now and Pakistan is still not there what we see other countries uh, hitting that plateau we are still way weeks behind right now uh, Mehveen your two points your two suggestions for all who are watching us uh, well, I hope that we don't hit that peak, uh, you know, uh, inshallah. And I hope nobody does, uh, you know, and I hope that the dust settles down for everyone as far as loss of human life is concerned. You know, I, I think that uh, um, human beings are so capable. They have such infinite potential that we will recover economically. Uh, but I hope that we don't have to lose life spirit. I hope that we come out of this thinking more optimistically about what we can do better, how we can not wait for things to happen. We should learn a lot from this. And, and I hope that we get to practice that a lot. And I hope that things don't need to become a daunting problem in our face before we start putting funds and efforts towards them. Uh, you know, so I hope that these things are not compromised and I hope we keep supporting them. Thank you. Inshallah, thank you so much Mary, for those points, fans, your two points to all those people who are watching us live right now, your closing points. Hussein, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this. I mean, this is part of building this movement mm -hmm. of having positive messages on going green. Uh, so thank you so much for organizing it. Um, right now we're in a, you could call it a, a simple crisis. Um, we know there is a simple solution. It's complicated to make, but once we have a vaccine, all of this is behind us. And there is no simple vaccine solution for climate change. It's a much more complicated <laughs> problem that goes much deeper into right. how our societies function. Um, and of course, people are a little less busy with climate change right now because, well, we have imminent threats to face. So, and I, I totally get that. Um, Still, our climate change problem is not going away. And if there's one thing that I know from history, in the end, it's the biggest economic opportunity of the 21st century. Transforming aviation, transforming big industry, transforming many car manufacturing, car production, how cars run, completely transforming our, our electricity grid. 
it's trillions and trillions and trillions of euros, dollars, rupees, whatever currency you want to be paid in. Um, so that work is still laid out for us. Um, in the meantime, I wish everybody to stay safe. I hope your loved ones are safe. Um, keep one and a half meter distance. We're doing pretty well. I think this is like uh, how many thousand miles. Um, so that works. Um, I know you guys are putting up the Hyperloop between Amsterdam and Paris. I uh, don't believe everything that is in the media. <laughs> there is there is actually a trek for the Hyperloop in the Netherlands. I yes. think it's one kilometer. So, you know, 500 to go before we're in Paris. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so uh, let's get through this simple crisis and then all work together on the global crisis that's coming. And, and fortunately, we have more time to fix that global crisis. Uh, and fortunately, it is a huge economic opportunity. That's very true. Let's focus on the global crisis. That's a message from France. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us on our BizWorks episode. Uh, if you're here, if you're here for the first time, please do not forget to subscribe to FunWorks Media uh, channel. Please do not forget to press that bell icon. We have a lot of more BizWorks coming up uh, next week as well. Uh, I'm going to touch upon the topic of millennials next week. So do stay tuned and, of course, do subscribe. And once again, thank you so much, France and Mehreen for being here with us, for joining us live. This is me, Zen Goplani, signing off. I wish all of you a great weekend. I know every day is a weekend now, but I still wish you a great <laughs> weekend. And I hope you all stay safe. And I hope you all stay healthy. Thank you so much signing out. Now, take care of yourself. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Ciao.